Good morning and welcome to Sustainable Action. This is Sue Spicer, your host. Welcome to Cozy Radio. If you're listening right this moment, you've gone to AudioRealm.com, typed Cozy into the search engine and press the listen icon. Thank you for listening today. We have a politician-ish, politician-ish <laughs> person in the house today. Brandon, would you like to introduce yourself to our listening audience? Hi, yes. My name is Brandon Hood. I'm running for 9th District Congressional, uh, Indiana District 9, uh, for the seat of House of Representatives. And uh, I'm here to talk about sustainability and green awesomeness. That's great to have you. I know we've we've come down in the social media realm. We're uh, friends on Facebook. We've we've been on separate sides of things on occasion, um, which is great because discussion is key. Absolutely. So, Trey Hollingsworth District, um, but you are a Democrat. Yes, ma'am. And you're running in the primary. Yes, ma'am. Are there opponents? Yes, we do have uh, three Democratic opponents. Uh, one is uh, Liam Doris, uh, another one is Andy Ruff, and the other opponent is Mark Powell, who has already been disavowed by the Democratic Party for his propaganda, use of propaganda, and, well, he's just kind of not a nice person. <laughs> well, it's good to see the Democrats stepping up. To yeah, that's very encouraging. It was very encouraging. Uh, I was I was worried there was going to be uh, a lack of political bravery there, and I'm glad that they uh, they uh, took the steps to hold him accountable and uh, not let him have all of the services that all, everyone else can have. Um, so I think that that's important to show uh, the constituency uh, that we care. So are, are you surprised that the two who ran in 2018 are trying again? Um. Well, it was a long road. I mean, Liz did get a chance to uh, have a great job in the Progressive Caucus in uh, Washington, D.C., so she's definitely trying to help change the world, so I can't blame her there. Um, as for Dan, I mean, he's just had a kid, and he's, he is helping uh, Andy Ruff. He is the treasurer for Andy Ruff. Um, so he is helping out. He did stay involved in politics. Um, I don't, you know, in the end, uh, we're trying to focus on our campaign, because uh, mainly when it comes down to it, the idea for us is to get out there and talk to people. Um, the, more of an explainer as to you know people who might be familiar with the race in the ninth from the last cycle. Yes. Um, so that they're like, well, I was I was going to vote for Liz. Right. Right. But no, no, she's not an option. Yeah. You need to look at the options that are there for your race this time. Yes. Exactly. I agree. So in in that thought, why you? Well, I've worked, uh, the way I look at it is that I've worked paycheck to paycheck my entire life. My parents worked paycheck to paycheck their entire life. And I feel like I have a unique perspective as it, come, as it pertains to uh, knowing how the everyday working person uh, has to live their life in this district. And I do not feel as if we're getting correct representation. We're not getting any real representation at all uh, if we have someone that's fully funded 85% by uh, super PACs, um, uh, we, we recognize that that is not someone that's representative to democracy in this district. Um, but not only that, I've, uh, I've, I've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of act activist work in Bloomington. Um, I've done, I've done mu many areas of research that I feel uh, are pertinent to helping this district come out of uh, a miasma of misrepresentation. Um, we have we have, we're, we're, we have a lot of work to do, and Trey has done nothing but shuffle feet, give corporate lines, and uh, continue to take big money. So we that's probably my biggest qualification is that I feel like I represent the working people of this district better than any of the other candidates and our current quote unquote representation. Sounds like a good argument to me. Um, Thank you. What's your number one issue? Well, I have, I have many. Um, it's hard to pick. It is hard to pick. There's five. There's four or five at the top. Climate change is absolutely top five. Um, criminal justice reform. Uh, the uh, taking care of Citizens United actually getting <laughs> getting the big money out of politics. We're not taking I'm, any power. I'm doing money. silent applause, folks, on the radio. <laughs> I'm doing silent applause. Uh, Health care is a huge one as well. We want to make sure that people have access to Medicare for all. 
uh, and that are, it's actually affordable. Um, Im improved Medicare for all. Yes, and then fi and then finally, uh, education expansion. Uh, we don't want to say free college because it gives us a negative connotation for some reason. Uh, we want to expand it so that it's it's obvious that you get to go to school as long as you want, uh, and it will not bankrupt you for the future. Well, it won't keep you from having I, financial I, freedom. I, I can test the, the as long as you want. Sure, I agree. <laughs> I, 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 I think you're phrasing. I think uh, you're misphrasing uh, your own no, position on that. One. Absolutely right. You're right. I, I think that it should be affordable, and uh, there are some, there should be restrictions on some level. You I'm need sure. to make the grades. Yeah, you do. And there's only so many degrees that I mean, you can't do education as a career. Yeah, that's not possible. <laughs> I, we're, we're, we're not talking about Animal House here. We're not talking yeah. about I'm, I'm going to retire as a student. <laughs> so I w just wanted to just I know some people like that in Indiana. I know. <laughs> I do too. That's, that's one of the reasons why it was uh, on my mind when, uh -huh. when, when with your phrasing. I was right. like, no, you don't mean exactly what you said. <laughs> so no, I'm going right, right. to pull you out of that one. Thank you. You saved me there, Sue. Well. I, I've had enough discussions with you online or mm -hmm. participated in the same discussions online, mm -hmm. and that's not what you meant. That's so, true. You're right. So I wanted, I to, agree. I wanted to clarify it is that not for I you. I definitely want people to have the opportunity uh, without the roadblock and the, uh, and the uh, predatory loan process. So what I look at when I'm looking at the education system, um, the, the early child care thing that Bernie just came out with. I've had guests on my show talk about this is the most important time in human development and we're not spending any money on it. And, yeah. um, and then you look at the 21st century c country and world that we're in and if you don't have a BA, it's hard for you to get a good job that mm -hmm. would give you an opportunity to get into the quote unquote middle class. Yeah. And then I look at the, the very truism that I was raised on, that a, a country is only strong as its weakest link. Yeah. And we're not in, in investing in the citizens of our country, we're a broken chain. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that people are aligned against making our country, its citizens, the best that they can be, that that common investment in our citizens is looked down upon, they've been bleeding our education system, is to me the most unpatriotic thing that we do as a nation. Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. We're only as strong as our weakest link, and right now you can buy people. Great, great, that's just great. <laughs> You know, and I'm, I say that completely sarcastically. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, Bernie's plan is to use a small transaction tax on uh, Wall Street to uh, make the trade schools and public university and, and colleges um, uh, basically, I think you have to buy your books mm -hmm. or something like that. Right. Um, and I haven't read into how he's funding the early education. I assume he's going to tax the rich. Yes. Um, I haven't read it yet, but it got some people I know incredibly excited. And if they're excited about this, I'm excited because yeah. they're the experts. Mm -hmm. So all things that if we put you in Congress that you will be uh, supporting or versions thereof? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that uh, we have to remove the barriers to receive good education and a good home, a, a, a decent job. I mean, those, those, they're put in place for a reason, and uh, the, we need trade schools again. I remember going to trade school when I was a kid. I, I, I remember very distinctly the banks of computers, and then there was over here you could work on steel stuff. And over here you were getting trained to learn how to operate machinery in the, in the factory. I know that some of those are uh, not exactly 
feel good things, but they are they are those type of uh, freedoms that will offer people to the knowledge to gain a good job in the future and or to be better their community if they decide they want to. And that's another thing is that we don't get people don't get a chance to do that in America. We're so we're working uh, one, two, and three jobs. I know I know many single moms right now have three part time jobs, uh, and then another 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 gig on the side making ten or twenty bucks a day. It's just you know th- th- this gig economy's got to go. We have to we have to invest in our people again, and that's what that's where we went off track. Is we decided to fund our huge military machine versus uh, all the other very very dear issues that we need to take care of. Yes, I was recently tweeting at someone that my my dismay on people being. Have, having nothing to say about our bloated military budget where we blow up our money and black and brown people around the world and they don't say a thing about that but when it comes to taking care of our citizens suddenly they are concerned about how we're going to pay for it. Mm-hmm. It's probably one of the most disingenuous questions we could ever ask ourselves if you think about it. It's <laughs> Why would you ask how much it's, it's going to cost to get health care? I would say uh, why isn't it here now? Um, and that's that's the thing is that we um, another thing about the military to expound upon that real quick is that they are the number one polluter in the world. Uh, we, <clears throat> from an environmental standpoint, just standing down half of the uh, military would help us environmentally in a, in a substantial way. Substantial way. Yeah, and uh, but that's and that's just the military and going along with that. Our entire, uh, our entire society, our societal paradigm is such that it's only centered around a car-centric gas and oil economy, and we have to we have to get outside of that. We need to start getting high-speed rails. Oh, uh, actually, teaching gardening in school. Maybe each 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 school in America has a greenhouse. There, we can get we can get creative, and that's what's gone. That's what's left of Democratic and Republican parties is creativity. I believe. There is an unwillingness to stop their gravy train, in my personal opinion. Yes. If to to buck the system at this point is to threaten your donors. You know the the, the donor class is mm-hmm. is, um, gosh, where's that study from? Um, there's there's studies that are that have give undisputable evidence that our legislators do not listen to the people anymore and the needs of the people, that when you break it down of who gets what they want out of the government, it's the people who write the checks. Mm -hmm. So we need to change that paradigm drastically. Yes. Um, Election reform Mm -hmm. in Citizens United, I I assume you're uh, right there with that one. Oh yeah, absolutely. We have, there's, I mean, I'm a big fan of paper ballots coming back. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm thoroughly over this whole computer mumbo jumbo. I mean, when it comes down to it, I understand that it helps the process go a little bit quicker. But they're fallible. Machines are fallible. They're not perfect. Um, they are hackable. They are absolutely hackable. And from what I've known, when I write, fill out a paper ballot, it's filled out. It can't be changed unless someone actually changes it. <laughs> so uh, I, I feel safer for me. Um, but that's just one portion of election, election reform. I mean, we can, the gerrymandering is getting is silly. There's so many strangely gerrymandered districts. I remember a funny well, talk time. about your district. Well, it's, it's very long, and it's uh, it goes all the way to the uh, southern border, um, and it goes all the way up to well, Greenwood. And then we, uh, it's, I think, so basically the biggest Frank, district. Franklin, Indiana, to um, our side of the river of Louisville. Yep, all New Albany, Jeffersonville, Clarksville. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty big district. So, and there's a and Greenwood. I I mean Greenwood. I don't really think should be in the district, but that's just me. I mean, and there's some there's some counties that are chopped in half, and you know it's 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 obvious why it's gerrymandered. It's gerrymandered so we can get to the ends of each of the districts so that there's that big money so that the big money can influence the election, um, as it always does. Um, and so we, our key is to make sure that we get in front of people and do stuff like this. Um, and we understand that uh, it's a tough road ahead, 
but um, in the end, we know that we're, we're representing uh, working people uh, in this district because that's what that's what mainly encompasses this district is working people. So, so you're knocking a lot of doors. Well, we haven't knocked on a whole lot yet. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say we haven't, uh, but we have we have knocked on over we have a couple of hundred, um, and that's that's an that We've been really trying to get to as many events as possible. That's been our biggest thing, and I also work a full time job. So right at this moment, it's a little bit tough to get out the doors, but we are we definitely have a schedule set up to where we're going to be uh, intentionally knocking on numerous doors daily. Um, we have uh, something like 10, 10 or eleven volunteers that are willing to get on to get their feet on the ground uh, and start talking to people face to face. Um, and basically, anytime we go anywhere like here we can't really canvas here because this is not really in the district but if we were to go to new albany say we would spend the day to canvassing down there and then if we went to franklin we would spend the day canvassing up there so well down there from here so you get the idea yes um, and it, it and that's part of um the alignment of the districts that um the republicans did yeah, I remember when I was a kid, we had, of course, we had more districts we, at the time. We did? Yes, we used, okay. we, we started, when I was a kid, I think um, 12, we had 12 house seats. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and, hmm. and they were uh, drawn in, um, they were grouped um, basically around, like, the, the big city in the center. Mm -hmm. In, instead of being strips, it would be where you could actually uh, make a loop campaigning through your district. Oh. Instead of doing this long way down and a long way back up, mm -hmm. it was it was a loop. So there were, it was the the distance you traveled where you could, you know, you could skip from one one county to. Um, another a lot easier and, yeah. and remain within your district. Yeah, it sounds like would be, like it, that would make democracy a little bit easier. Yeah, but it's harder to to divide up people's votes and choose your voters. Um, see, the, I have a big problem with our state legislature um, from both party establishment. The, the Democrats started the gerrymandering and the Republicans finished it. And they're, both sides are unwilling to let the voters choose their representation, which is a strike against democracy. Yeah. Either, either party that doesn't want exactly, um, how do I put this? We need the um, commission that's made up of people who are never going to run for office, who is a bipartisan group of people, people who are experts in the geography and such things of our state, we need those people drawing up our districts um, mm -hmm. in, in the population specific ways that the census will tell us. That's what we need. We, sure. to, to have politicians picking out their own voters is um, proof that they don't believe in democracy. Yeah. Absolutely, and the barriers that we see nationally, locally, state level, uh, there's all kinds. I mean, you, there's the times when, uh, and well, one for instance that comes to mind uh, that I did not know about until this year, and I, I, I'm okay with admitting that I didn't know something, it, uh, that there's a cutoff to where you can register, and then when you can, re you can, uh, <clears throat> you, well, a cutoff to uh, when you can register and when you can't register, and there's a, a three or four month window in there where the, uh, in the year, that you can't actually register for the party for any uh, for to vote in Indiana. Well, they they shut off um, um, the books a month out. Okay, is it a month? I could well, be wrong. Well, so so here's the rub with the early voting now. It it turns into two months. Mm -hmm. So you because they have to close the books, mm -hmm. so they have a certain set of books on who the voters are. Right. So. It would translate into two months for the primaries and two months for the general mm -hmm. uh, because they do close the books a month out. Right. Okay. But that they do it so they can have a um, a set a, a set electorate so people can't come in and do things. But with that said, there's a bunch of states that have same day registry. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Same day registry. And one thing I, I'll give Indiana is we do have an open primary. Uh, that is one thing we do have that I think is is a step in the right direction for sure. And it's better than some. Yeah. Where we do have. <sighs> it surprises me when we actually are ahead of the curve somewhere. <laughs> no. Don't get me started on ranked choice voting. Uh, I would love to see that happen. Well, that's a, and that's a dichotomy. Mm. And that's a dichotomy because I don't know that people will will have to do so much education for people to understand how the person that started out third when they counted the first time wins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, people are gonna people are gonna have to be highly educated to to get with that system. Yeah. Um, what I would like to see is, man, there's so many things I'd like to see that just all popped up in my head. I hear that. Um, but it shouldn't be the, the signature burden um, for alternative voices. Um, it's not healthy, in my opinion, for our country to be stuck in a duopoly where mm -hmm. you have choice A or choice B. Um, that have any chance of viability, mm -hmm. and and I think that undercuts our democracy. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, people in California don't understand what it's like in Indiana, um, and they want they want an end to the electoral college, mm -hmm. which, on the surface, I say okay. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. But you'll never get that constitutional amendment through in the country. I would like to see the constitutional amendment that I do think would get through about the Electoral College, and that would be to end winner take all. Yeah. Because there's Republicans in California who are going, my vote never counts. <laughs> right. Just like there's Democrats in Indiana going, my vote never counts. Right. So we have this, this is something that we can agree on. We can get 35 states to say no more winner take all on the Electoral College, but we will never get 35 states to say end the Electoral College. You know, that's, uh, I'm just going to have to agree with you um, because I don't know enough about the Electoral College and what they would say in California. What I can say is that uh, the Electoral College often uh, does not represent our best interests. That's for sure, um, and super delegates are quite an issue. And I think I hope that they don't. And that's come to within play. The, that's the Democratic Party's system of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th and of course we know why the super delegates are there. Um, they are there because they want they get basically get to decide who becomes the nominee um, if they don't like it. Which you know I don't I think it'll be not I think it will be Bernie this time. I think that there's going to be so much support that it's going to be impossible for it him not to be the nominee. We'll, we'll see where that breaks down after Super Tuesday. Yeah, we will. Um, after Super Tuesday, if Bernie does as good as his supporters, which I am one. Um, <laughs> I am two. Uh, he does as well as we are working for him to do. Yeah. Then there won't be a brokered convention because he'll win straight up. Yeah. Win. Yeah. Um, America is a bandwagon kind of nation. Mm -hmm. And he comes out with, he wins the majority of states, wins the majority of delegates. Um, people are just going to climb on board. They will. There's still going to be a strong opposition to him because he represents a change in the way that we do political business in this country. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know that's what we need. That is what we need, and, and the mainstream media will continue to push that narrative until uh, the election's over. And I would love to see them back off off Bernie from that point, but I don't think they will. I think he's going to have a, he's already hamstrung for a little bit. But I, I do believe in his ability to get things done. And I, I do believe in his uh, every every statement that he's made on his first hundred days in office. I feel that he genuinely wants to happen, and he will enact. All of those, there's all of those uh, executive orders to try to make things happen uh, to our better detriment, to our better betterment, not better detriment. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. Yeah. So we had uh, climate change. We had um, the 
Citizens United, we have um, education. What are my other? T what were Corrupt we? Oh wait, we already talked about corruption. Um, let's see, criminal justice reform. Ooh, what would you? Where would you go in, in the house? What would you be? Um, what co-signing? What would you be? Um, um, what, um, proposing. Um, well, Bernie has. We we're, we're keep talking about Bernie. Um, he's very, very thorough. Um, he, he does he have. Is. He has a lot of bills ready to go. Um, and from what I've seen of his criminal justice reform bill, I it's a good start. There's a lot. There's a lot that we have to take care of. Uh, when you get inside the jail, you have the bail system. You have you have mandatory minimums. You have uh, you have. I mean, you may. Those two right there are huge. Uh, and then once you're actually in the system itself, it's the probation, the house arrest, the extra fees here and there, whatever they decide they want to put you in jail because you did something wrong. Um, and it's uh, and it's designed for people to be re, re into the system. And so we have to we have to really take a look at how much we're incarcerating people because when you sit some when you think about all the nonviolent criminals that are in jail currently, nonviolent criminals. Um, there's a, they're over half, and 10 million people hit the system each year. There may only be 2.5 in jail, but 10 million people go through the prison and justice system yearly. So, yeah, we need to. They don't. They, we, there's not that many. Drugs shouldn't be a crime. Why do we have more people Especially. in jail than China? Oh, it's a great. That's a great question. Um, and China has. Three, almost four times as many people as we have. Right. <laughs> and we're, but we're really good at locking up people. Um, and I've seen, we've seen time after time, story after story of uh, how cities have decided to uh, make a prison instead of building a new school. And we we just got, we have a priority street. I mean, we don't have a priority street, and that's a problem uh, because um, people should be looking forward to an education, should be looking forward to a decent job. Uh, when If you were in inner, inner city, if there's a good chance you're gonna, there, half of the people in America have a, a close family member that have spent serious time in jail. Uh, that's over a year in jail. And that's half of the people in, the, in America. So uh, there's a lot, I could continue to go on and on and on with statistics, but in the end, um, we have a, it's not just failing, it's broken, a justice system. Uh, so you have a rural district, technically, with some cities within it, and do you have any of the private prisons in your district? Uh, no, there are no private prisons in our district, I don't think, so. I, I, I'm pretty sure there are none. Well, that's a, that's a bonus for you. That is a bonus, yes, for that, me. that means that you don't have to explain to them how you're going to find them employment. <laughs> well, there, yes, exactly, and that's another thing, is the stigma of being arrested, uh, carry, it doesn't just stop with you spending your time in jail, which is already too much. Uh, it's, it, it also continues as you try to get employment. Any type of real, really good job that pays well, you're not, there's uh, slim to no chance you're going to be able to get it if you have a felony on your record. We know this. There, there are very few large corporations that take, take chances on people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what how do we expect anyone to recover from missteps and encounters with law enforcement if there's the question on there, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yeah, exactly. That, that question is like a, 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 a trap for mm -hmm. people who are attempting to rebuild their lives. Sure, and especially drug tests. Drug testing at a, at a, a new job is... I can understand if this job was one of those jobs where you were constantly on a crane or you're constantly operating heavy equipment or something. Truck then, driver, yeah, then I could maybe see, but not, I mean, it's still unconstitutional, and it is a way to keep people from getting employment. So if somebody has uh, cannabis in their system and it comes up negative, does that mean that they're incompetent to do that job? No. It just means that when they're at home and not at the job, Maybe they smoke a little bit of cannabis, and that's the problem. Is that they're being, uh, or maybe they have social anxieties. Yes, I mean, and, and, and it helps them. And you know, they are a PTSD veteran. Yes, absolutely. Who has trouble getting out the door, and a little bit of cannabis puts them in a position to where they can button up their shirt mm -hmm. and walk out 
the door. Yeah, or if they're a cancer survivor and they just need to eat a damn good meal. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that. I mean... So, there, I, <coughs> I see no viable argument against medical cannabis. Mm-hmm. I, it, it's ridiculous. There's too many places where this is working mm-hmm. to the betterment. If Indiana, per se, had, um, had legal medical just legal medical mm-hmm. would take care of such a layer of people and hurt and discomfort and anxiety and diet issues. Mm-hmm. And they w- if it were legal for medical, they wouldn't even have to smoke it anymore. They yep. could they could t- take the medicine take their medicine in an edible. Yeah. And 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 that type of thing. In a non-stigmatized way. In a non-stigmatized way, mm-hmm. where you know when they. They feel the the walls closing in, and there's too many people in this room. They could just open up their tin and take a little candy out, and yeah. and, and and suck on that hard candy, and and then be okay. Yeah. In that situation, we are we are stealing from our veterans' quality of life mm-hmm. by not opening this medical situation up. Mm-hmm. That's why there's veterans groups for. Uh, medical marijuana in Indiana. Yeah. It's the the reason why we've got actual Republicans in our state house going for medical marijuana. It's because the pressure they're receiving from the veterans groups. Nice. Well, I hope I hope that they can achieve that. And Karen Talian has done a lot of work on that as well. Absolutely. Got to give her a, a lot of credit in, in this assembly. She's uh, she's been thwarted so many times and she just keeps fighting and I, I fully support her as an attorney general for Indiana so it's a there's there is there is a and <clears throat> to continue with drug use uh, and the stigmatization uh, we have in Bloomington we have something called the IRA the Indiana Recovery Alliance and they are a needle exchange um, where you can go in get needles as you need them no stigma you just have a, a, a little anonymous ID uh, and you hand it to them, and without any judgment, they give you syringes and naloxone if you need it, Narcan, um, and do any training. Uh, and if you need other things, they have other toiletries and things on site so that you can uh, safely use your drug of choice, whatever it is you're shooting up into. So it's like a um, Norwegian model? I don't know if that's what they call it. Um, I know it's called a harm reduction. They, they, it's considered harm reduction in Bloomington. Um, because the idea is to get people to stop hurting themselves, um, and so this reduces in spreading disease and yeah, exactly, and exactly, pre- and and that's the societal positive on that one, folks. Mm-hmm. If you're worried about needle exchange programs, um, I ask you to take a step back and look at the problem from the overhead view. No, we don't want them shooting up drugs. Yeah, we don't. Of course, we're not we're we're not advocating them doing that. But here they are in this position. Now, was it because the, they got injured at work and they were given a basically toxic, um, addictive drug like Oxycontin, and now then they can't get that anymore, so they switch to say, um, what, heroin mm-hmm. is, yeah. the, is the big switch? Yeah. So, so here we as a society have allowed them because the profiteering of the pharmaceutical industry, we have allowed them to become drug addicts. Yeah. So do we turn a blind eye to um, the the fact that our policies have failed them? I say no. I I would absolutely agree. So do we want them spreading disease? Do we want them stealing for their habit? And or dying. And or dying, stealing and dying. All things that happen to people who find themselves in this position. Um, these exchange programs don't. Um, I saw a documentary about the the program that they do with the National Health Service in Britain. Okay. The people who are in line at the Narcan places, they are considered losers. Yeah. When, when people walk by and they see that line, they're like, well, I'm never falling in that trap. Yeah. 
So there, there is That's no also another way people die, is that uh, maybe they do fall into that trap and they become too proud and they don't want to be stigmatized and then they overdose and they die. Where they use that, that dirty needle and mm -hmm. contract something worse. Mm -hmm. And now they're, not only are they, uh, now they might be spreading other diseases mm -hmm. within our communities with, you know, you, you don't know who is doing what in you their don't. private time. Exactly, and that's that's the thing about heroin is that it, it does affect the, the white community, uh, and it's not it's not just one certain sector of the population. It's all it's it's far reaching all over the place, and it's been, it's been pervaded by our medical system because when these people get on years of painkillers, uh, it's hard. And once you're off and, you're, the, and the supply stops, you you reach out for other options, and that's. There's a there's a, a naloxone clinic in Canada. I think it's in Quebec. Um, I'm not quite for sure on that. But they have uh, what they'll do is they'll supervise while you shoot up. You just you have your own little spot, and there's someone on staff that's there in case you overdose. And they were having um, the over or to keep you from overdosing. To keep you from overdosing, yes. And they have had zero deaths now there uh, because of it. Um, at the center. Um, there's 70 people that die a year, I mean a day, in the United States from overdoses. So, And these programs offer ways for you, if you want to get off, mm -hmm. they put these resources in front of you and give you the opportunity. And mm -hmm. imagine having um, no options, being, being an addict because you got hurt at work. That's what started it when you got hurt at work and you got put on pain medicine, now you're an addict and you don't have your job, you don't have health insurance, you don't, you can't go to the rehab place. Because you didn't stop yet. A lot of times they make you stop first, the rehab place make you stop first. So, so there's so many holes in this system and who loses? All of us. All of us lose by looking at this in a specific, I'm not going to support a drug addict. Yeah, this the whole not in my backyard type of mentality. Um, if we continue that as as Americans, this this is the country we live in. This is the country where you have to lock your doors. This is the country where you have to hide the packages in your vehicle, or they'll break the window in. Mm -hmm. We didn't used to be that country. Mm -hmm when we were taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. And if we want the country where we don't lock our doors, where everybody who works hard actually can make it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as you said, you know, single moms with three part-time jobs, that's not the America I want to live in. No, not at all. And that's not, that's not having a social safety net. That is uh, making us pull up, that's that rugged individualism that, uh, We've heard in the past from some great people, um, and that whole pulling up your boot by your bootstraps mentality. Um, we, it's okay to help your neighbor. It's okay to be there for your friends. It's okay to be there for others. Maybe even someone you don't know. It's okay to fight for those people. And I think that uh, I think that we've lost that energy. I feel like we've lost that uh, hope in uh, in the world around us. And I think that we need to. Um, I, I feel like I feel like people are afraid to change, and I think that the only way that we can make that happen is to keep trying. Um, I don't. I, giving up is not uh, a possibility for me, and I don't think that uh, anyone in this district really wants to give up. But I feel like there are a lot of people willing to give up because there's not a whole lot. To, there's not a whole lot going on right now that gives people joy. Um, with the current administration and with the economic uh, policies there and, um, and the slow degradation of all that we've worked for to this point. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough one. And yet we still go on with hope. Mm -hmm. And I work at things, I, I attempt to take the word try out of my vernacular mm -hmm. because people, I work at it. I'm yeah. not trying to do anything. I'm working um, at it. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Uh, and I encourage our listening audience to focus on the work and not on the try. So we have 
we're still missing one. We haven't we haven't talked about um, the fifth of your top five, and I forgot to write them down. So, so the Green New Deal. How do you feel about the Green New Deal? Well, the Green New Deal. Um, the one thing I've run into so far is that uh, my district is District Nine is a little bit more uh, rural. So because of that, uh, the Green New Deal may not be as palatable. So we're going to call it a uh, federal job guarantee. And uh, it's basically the same thing. Um, but basically what we're trying to say is that we need to, we need to build infrastructure, rebuild our crumbling infrastructure badly. I mean, we're still in the 19th century in some areas uh, on bridges and whatnot. Um, and uh, not only that, we need to have, uh, we need to build those social safety nets. We need to start uh, reinvesting back into our communities uh, in terms of uh, gardening programs like I was talking about. And or uh, Minnesota's doing a thing where you plant a certain amount of your yard as wild, wildflowers or prairie, you get a tax deduction. Um, and finding new creative ways to, uh, to have energy efficient everything. I mean, we need to really look at the way we, we approach all of our lives. I mean, we're already car-centric. We're, everyone's already got a car. That's not changing anytime soon. So what other changes can we make? Um, I, I always tell people, eat less meat. I mean, that's a big one. Um, you, can, you can teach your kids to be, have, have a, a green outlook on life. Um, my son, uh, he's seven years old. He already knows about solar panels. He already... Yeah, he's already eating. He's already almost a vegetarian now because he doesn't. He doesn't want to eat animals. He understands that they're living beings. So there's, there's, uh, with what the Green New Deal slash federal job guarantee means to me is that that's the beginning of that paradigm shift we were talking about, where we, uh, because we really do only have about ten years left if we keep going at the rate we're going, maybe less, maybe more, or maybe less. We might already be on the over the tipping point, yeah. and we're getting ready to. Right now we're on that ka chunk a chunk a chunk a chunk going up the the uh, on the roller coaster yeah. where we're 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 chunking up and we're going up to the top where we can finally see what kind of mess we're in. Yeah. And then we're gonna plunge into um, the chaos yeah. of an ever changing planet. Mm-hmm. And it's gonna be become more severe. And we know we, we know those effects. Um, we've seen those, and I was remarking earlier uh, today how um, there was probably maybe five days total of snowfall in Bloomington, Indiana, um, where I live, and that's that's not very far away from Indy, um, and I, I can distinctly remember over the last 20 years that I've lived there that there's been at least 12 inches to 15 inches of snowfall each year. So, I mean, that's just one year, one season. But in the end, I, I, I think we're seeing the effects, and it's... I've been paying attention to the weather since I was a small child. My dad was a truck driver, mm-hmm. and I've been, I've been paying attention for basically 50 years. Mm-hmm. And it's different. Yeah, it is. There's hardly any snow anymore. It is different. And those differences matter, because snow is a unique distributor of um, different... Uh, minerals and mm-hmm. such. Yes. So farm fields um, are depleting. One with the um, um, terrible farm f- farming practices mm-hmm. um, that's not only killing our rivers and the, the Gulf, but you know we we all have Roundup in our systems now. Yep. When they when they test us, um, which is terrifying. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. We're we're science projects. I, yes. I, I say that all the time. We you know, we're, we're we're the science experiment, and Europe is the control group because they don't use um, GMOs, and they don't use they they don't allow um, things that we don't know quite what they're going to do to us. Mm-hmm. So in Europe, they're not having the spikes in cancer. They're yeah. not having the same medical um, situations as we do in America, where we're getting fatter and sicker. Mm-hmm all the time. Mm -hmm. So as a society, our agricultural choices, um, it was in 72 when Nixon's Secretary of Agriculture told farmers to uh, feed the world by switching to chemistry for growing food instead of biology. Yeah. That's insane on the face. Yes. Yes. But that's, that's what we did and... They incentivized it too. 
That's the thing, is that, and that's the way all governments try to push changes. Corporate, 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 corporate. That's right, and that brings us to uh, healthcare. I think that was the fifth one that we didn't talk about yet. Uh, we, I think we touched on it briefly, but uh, but yeah, our agricultural system um, is absolutely feeding into uh, our uh, broken healthcare system, which is uh, which does not have preventative care. Only has uh, cancer care, sick care. I like to call it sick care system because yes. they don't treat us until we're sick, and then it's a it's a profit grab, and it's been that way for a very long time. And we frankly, Nixon. I'm tired of it. Um, Nick, and Nick, Nixon made it. He, it was his, during his administration that it became legal for mm -hmm. companies to profit off our health care. I think it was like 78 or 76 was when they stopped profit, when they started profiting again. And that's the thing is that you should not be able to profit off someone else's misery. I think I find that to be inherently disgusting. Um, and the fact that we're still doing it is um, it's just indicative of how deep corporate pockets go. Because uh, in the end, you are a human being. And you deserve, at the end of your life, when you transition, to go with dignity and respect. And when someone tells you, well, you got to give up 150 grand for that, or you just can't have that surgery, well, what does that do? Maybe you spent your, the last 20 years saving that 150 grand, and maybe that was going to go to your grandchildren. Um, now they don't get that chance. And that's just one, that's just one aspect. Let's not, we're not even going to talk about the poor people who actually do die. I had a friend of mine... Who, uh, most, who used to mow my lawn. I don't mow my lawn anymore because I let that stuff grow. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, food, not lawns. Um, but uh, he used to mow my lawn, and he told me a story of how his son had a kink in his intestines, and they made him wait two weeks to see a specialist, uh, and he died the day before he got to see the specialist. Um, and that's what they do in this country. That's what insurance companies do. They hem and haw, and they push you, and they wait, and make you wait longer, and make you self-advocate. And then, and then sooner or later, either something worse happens, which is more profit, or you die. Which is, there is still a cash grab there, too. It's because you're... 76,000 Americans die every year from lack of prompt health care. Yep, and almost 500,000 of them go bankrupt every year. Yeah. So, I don't, that's another aspect of that social safety net, uh, that, that uh, looking out for each other. And also... Uh, Understanding that we need to take our healthcare system back. It's been it's been taken by the insurance middlemen. That's why it's so expensive. We would say 450 billion uh, first couple of years just by getting rid of insurance middlemen. Um, Streamlining the process so the administration of all of our healthcare had one set of paperwork instead of a hundred sets. Of paperwork. That's right. There's over a thousand providers and. <laughs> in America right now. And, and they all that, have their own forms. And they all have their own forms. That, that, well, I'd like to say they all have their own ways of saying no. Um, and that's what it is. They're, they're there to tell you no. Um, and if, if they will say yes if it's, if it's within profit. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the uh, medical system in a nutshell. Um, we could definitely go. There's, it's way more complicated. We could definitely talk. That, I, mean, I, I can talk about it all day. Um, I know. I love, I love it when I get to, um, well... The, the conversations that I will have with people when they say, well, you know, Medicare for all will be a death panel. I said, no, a death panel is when the insurance company tells you that you've maxed out your benefits. Yep. That's a death panel. And then you're stuck for the last two months of your insurance year or whatever, or 30 days or without care. Or lifetime. Yeah, or lifetime. You get a lifetime limit, that's, and they say, no, no more care for you. You're on GoFundMe. Yeah. GoFundMe is not a medical plan. No, it's not. It's not at all. Um, you shouldn't have to crowdsource uh, to be healthy. As, as Americans, we should be ashamed of ourselves. And anytime anybody tries to call us a Christian nation anymore, I just laugh at them. Yeah, I and mean, it's, it's, yeah, that's, it's silly to think that because at our very core, we, we, we don't care about people that are actually poor. And it, it was, it was very clear, um, it, if, if you are um, a follower of Jesus, you know, in Matthew 25, um, I think 35 to 41, you know, basically it breaks down to what you do to the least of mine, you do unto me, said Jesus. So, you know, and his examples were, you know, you fed me, 
you took care of me when I was sick, or you fed me when I was hungry, you took care of me when I was sick, you visited me when I was in jail for this and everything else, you go to heaven. So I look at the policies of our country, you know, we, we go to war, we, we kill innocent people, knowingly killing innocent people. The fact that we have dropped a bomb on a wedding. Yeah. Um, but they want me to be all patriotic about American. But, you know, we're talking about my soul here. Yeah, exactly. And when we're talking about the soul of America, we need to take a hard look in the mirror. And I think candidacies like yours gives an opportunity to be, for people to make a choice about the American that they want to have. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're not trying to close businesses. You're trying to help entrepreneurs leave that job that they hate because you want to give them improved Medicare for all to where their insurance isn't tied to their job. Mm -hmm. And siphoning away their money. Siphoning away. Oh, my goodness. The copays. So for people who haven't uh, done the math, the Medicare, improved Medicare for all that uh, Senator Sanders is proposing will take away your premiums, your co-pays, your um, deductibles, deductibles mm -hmm. and put a tax on you, a, a payroll tax, and that's how all the, all, all the industrialized nations in the world handle it. Mm -hmm. And all of them are looking at us, they're looking at Bernie's plans, and they're going, you know, I've heard it from Australians, I've heard it from Canadians, I've heard it from, um, what do you call Great Britain people? Um, European? Well, that, it, I have British. British, that's the one. <laughs> I've heard it from British people, I haven't heard it from other countries because I, I do have a lot of friends, but I haven't blanketed Europe yet. Sure. Um, <laughs> we'll wait for your research report. Right? <laughs> um, but all of them are talking about what he is proposing is better than what they have. Mm -hmm. I like that negotiating starting place. Yeah. I want all of it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to compromise on it. And, and I think that the people who are uh, mad at Bernie for wanting America to have the best need to look at themselves in the mirror a little bit mm -hmm. and decide what kind of America that they want to be. They want, they want to be the one that is Christ-like, that does take care of its citizens, that we have a baseline of humanity for everyone, where we can be an educated, healthy public, or do we just want to blow up our money and make enemies around the world? Because that's what we're doing currently. That's what we're doing. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, in the end, I... Um, so no rubber stamp from you on the war budget? No, absolutely not. Um, if we find me get voting for the war budget, I probably shouldn't be in office. Um, I don't, Which I, brings us to Trey. He, he, is, he should not be in office. Uh, Trey is bought and paid for. Um, is, he bought his first seat. He's buying this seat. Um, I've, I actually haven't seen Trey take on a tough speaking engagement since he took office. Um, he, does he, he do town halls? He says he does. I've not witnessed any anything purporting this statement. I've, I've never seen I've, I've never seen the event on Facebook. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually never seen a Trey Hollingsworth uh, town hall event scheduled at all. I would have went, um, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, and I do actually pay attention to Trey. I'm on his email list. Mm -hmm. um, after the 2018 race, or well, because of the 2018 race, mm -hmm. I was paying attention to to that. Apparently, he does a lot of um, small little things where he'll walk into the cafe or he'll walk in to, he'll walk into places, yeah. but he doesn't do like, hey, I'm gonna be at this high school. Come talk with me. Yeah, he never does that. He stays. He keeps it real safe, um, and that's that's indicative of somebody that's not really trying to represent us. That's indicative of someone that's just trying to skate by. Um, and we, that's not what I will be doing. I will be spending most of my time in the district. 
um, only going back to Washington to vote, basically. Um, I understand there's other stuff that I may have to take care of there, but I, I will be predominantly in this district working because uh, if I'm able to actually get the nomination and get elected, um, I understand there's still a tough road ahead for all of that. But in the end, we think we have a great shot uh, and we see a path to victory. Um, and and we want to let Trey know that uh, his seat's going to be seat's going to be empty soon and filled by someone else, and it's not going to be him. Um, and that's what matters to us most. That's a good goal. Yes, it is. I believe so. So, do you have any events scheduled currently? Uh, we just had a house party at the house, uh, at my house. Um, it was okay attended. We we were really glad that everyone showed up. Um, currently, we are answering questionnaires and getting our forums lined up. We have uh, five or six forums coming up in the next week or two. Um, let's see. Uh, so you have uh, Facebook.com slash elect Brandon Hood, and that's um, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-H-O-O-D. You have hoodforindiana.com, so people can reach out to you there. You also have a Gmail account, the brandonhoodindiana at gmail.com, that people can...